Well, I think this year it's certainly going to be different. Um, I hope it'll be more peaceful. I hope it'll be at a slower pace. Um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I, I know it's a difficult time of the year for many people because of all the rushing around, the Christmas presents, the, the cards, there's so much to do. And I know that you know the levels of anxiety and depression go sky high at Christmas. Um, but um, I think this Christmas, with it being slower, maybe we can, or I can, concentrate more on what the full meaning of Christmas is. You know, we read on Christmas cards about peace on earth, goodwill to all men. And I hope rather than just reading a card and sticking it on the mantelpiece, I hope I can really have time to think about that message. You know, we have that the wonderful message of the birth of Christ, you know, the saviour of the world, and that's what we celebrate. And so I hope that I get time to really um, enter into the full message of Christmas and to know that peace um, and joy of Christmas. And I pray this not just for myself, but for my family, my church family, and for the world, peace on earth. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus.
tonight for lonely stable with the oxen standing by we shall see him but in heaven set at God's right hand on high when like stars his children crown holy white shall wait around Good evening and a very warm welcome to our contemporary carol service here at St Barnabas Church, Middlesbrough. It's really great that you're able to join with us this evening. I don't know what Christmas is going to mean to you this year. None of us could have known how 2020 was going to turn out. But there are some things which are always worth celebrating. And tonight we celebrate an event that happened many years ago, 2,000 years ago in fact, many miles from here in the Middle East, the birth of Jesus Christ. No one has arguably had as big an impact on history as Jesus. He never wrote a best-selling book, never held political office, never made millions in business. And yet here we are, all these years later, miles away from his homeland, celebrating his birth. Now I wonder what will Christmas mean to you this year? When we sing carols, I do hope you can join in at home and really enjoy them together wherever you are. Uh, but for now, here's a reading. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch of their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid, I bring good news, that will cause great joy for all the people today in the town of David. A saviour has been born. To you he is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in, wrapped in cloths and laying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those whom his favour rests. And the angels had left them and gone into heaven. The shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this great thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. You're a big Christmas fan. Yes, I love Christmas. <laughs> I think mainly being around loved ones and just thinking of what the year's brought us and then hoping for a better year next year and then thinking of God's love for all of us as well.
and floods, rocks, hills and plains. Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy.
After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Um, I think it'll mean the same as every other year. It's God taking the initiative and coming to us as a man to come to our rescue. And whatever else is different, that is still the same. Christmas for me this year means what is always meant, years past and years to come. For me, it means a saviour has been given to us. It's Christ's birthday. I know this year it's going to be different um, because of the pandemic, like we may not be able to be with families, but it's just like every other birthday. Sometimes you've got big parties, sometimes you've got small parties. So for me, it's always the same. And um, it means we have our savior. He was given to us. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Christmas tells us how much God cares for us. And in Jesus, God knows what it's like to be human. Because God cares for us, he encourages us, he invites us to bring our troubles and our concerns, the things that we need help with 
to him. And so in a moment of quiet now, I'm going to invite you to simply name in the quiet of your own heart the concerns that you have, any, any worries, any troubles, either for yourself or for somebody else. And then after a moment's quiet, I'm going to pray for us. Loving God, we thank you that you care for us. We thank you that in Jesus, you know what it's like to be human. And we bring before you now the things that concern us, that worry us today, the things that we need your help with, whether that be something for ourselves or somebody else. And we pray that we might know your peace, your joy, and your help at, the, at this Christmas time. Amen. Three knocks wake our snowman from his slumber. Setting, snowy December. Title, the snowman. Three, a bit like the one that always gets shown at Christmas on the telly. Think of this as an unexpected end to a trilogy. Except all is not well. This horizon has limits. He's not sure he feels free. And so this snowman of ours believes he's not a snowman and tries to change his story. And so three knocks bring the next day in December. A day our snowman wanted to be another and so became the smart man. Except he just wasn't a very smart man, not quite as sharp as the rest of his clan and studied ten times harder than all the rest who'd ride the waves of deadlines peacefully. Their leisurely press stroke peeping their intellectual pedigree just above the surface. Whilst all our snowman could do was wildly tread water and swallow mouthfuls of it kicking under wraps with the weight of work, but barely breathing, not a smart man, just a snowman with a smartphone that kept freezing. And so three more knocks bring the next day in December, a day our snowman wanted to be another, and this time became the showman. Except he was permanently deadpan and drunk Turkish coffee and grew out a majestic beard while wearing oversized jumpers star brand new as hand-me-down vintage copies. And then he formed a band, the Frosty Jacks, a band of five, their Instagram bio reading, second-hand year eight school keyboard vibes. But times after COVID were hard. They just couldn't get gigs. And eventually they split up because of creative indifferences. And so our snowman left that life behind for a marketing career, but still kept the shaved remnants of his beard in a bag as a souvenir. And so three more knocks bring the next day in December, a day our snowman wanted to be another. And this time he became the strong man. He ate bran, drowned in protein shake and spent all his time at the gym. But his arms never got bigger because they were literally stick thin. And then three more knocks came and he changed again. And finally, he tried the soul man. Ba -da 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 -da. Except he only pretended to like that song and all this cool funk malarkey. And for every time he tried to be the life and soul of every party, there'd always be another time he hardly spoke. Sad, our snowman squeezed out but one solitary tear that barely trickled before it froze. Even the space to mourn thawed thin. Another December day drew to a close. And with new portrait in mind, our snowy friend clasped his brush tight and laid waste to paint his next face again, except those split ends that splayed were now frayed, frozen, thinning, bristles, falling softly to still rest like dead straw on a threshing floor that no one was ever going to gather. He shivered and for the first time he felt the cold. And three more knocks bring the next day in December, except 
this time, the third knock never came. Instead, he heard a piercing crack in glass far above his head on a snow globe skyline. A snowman rocks back in shock on his feet, dazed at first sight at this canopy curved barrier, his eyes tracing up and over and along the dome's giant glass exterior. And that's when he spots a glimmer near the crack. A brief flash of light bouncing back, a glint that plays games with his enlarged pupils. Animated snowmen only ever seem to have those eyes that are dots without the circles. And something, something suddenly appears to be laying in front of him, only a few metres apart. The globe's glow coming to rest on a ball of shoveled thick snow that all at once is camouflaged and stuck out like a sore thumb. He springs up making haste to meet it and be by its side, and driven by abandon, he doesn't really know why, and then he sees it. Except it isn't really an it, but looks a bit like him. No snow angel, a bit unimpressive, though with eyes that are just kind of magnetic and seem to see him more than he sees it. He leans in taken in with this little one's eyes, pulled past and into the world of sorts that hides behind them. A pause. He could stay here a while. And that's when it happens. The little one blinks. Booms and clangs quake from up above as the place suddenly shakes with the force of a thousand peals of thunder all clapping at the same time and that crack above the snowman's head falls through completely. Splintered ripples sent back down the dome that encased him. Glass shatters to his sides as thumping frosty air swooshes in, an air he always felt he was maybe made to breathe, but like breath he'd never quite known as he adjusts now to new globe without a hugging, fragile coat. The snowman breaks gaze for a moment from the son of man and squints out before him to see a glowing arctic expanse of everything. Snowcaps smiling back at him. Here was a snowman who always had been, but always belonged to a different dome. Here was a place without glass he could freely roam. But how? But whom? Sacred infant, all divine. What a tender love was thine, thus to come from highest bliss down to such a dome as this? Hail thou ever blessed morn, hail redemption's happy dawn, for it was seeing and believing amid the winter snow that we peered down deep into kingly baby's eyes, and to our surprise, finally found that snowmen were snowmen, and found too that we were home. See amid the winter snow, born for friends on earth below. See the tender land peace, promise from eternal years. Hail thou ever blessed. Redemption's happy dawn See through all Jerusalem Christ is born in Bethlehem Long within a major lies He who built the stars Oh
tender love was thine thus to come from highest bliss down to such a world as this hail thou ever blessed more hail redemption's happy Hello everyone, my name is Joe. I hope you enjoyed the snowman poem just a few moments ago and it's a real joy to join you on camera sharing a couple of thoughts about the carol service now. I hope this finds you well from wherever you're watching the other side of your screens. I'm in York at the moment. Uh, I know Seb actually, who's with you presently at St Barnabas and so um, real joy to be able to join you and I hope that whatever I'm about to share can bring some help, maybe even some hope for you the other side of your screens. Now I start with a little bit of a Christmas confession. When I was about five years old I was utterly convinced that my dad was the Santa Claus. He concocted this whole story about him going up the stairs, going to the airing cupboard at the end of the landing, shutting the door behind which he'd magically transform into Santa, fly all over the world and deliver presents. And I bought this hook, line and sinker. I remember reading a little Christmas story around the same time and I turned to the page about Santa's name and in it, it said that Santa's name was Saint Nick. And my dad's name is Nick. And like Sherlock, I was joining the dots and oh my word, it's true. My dad is the Santa Claus. And you can imagine my dismay, can't you? When he turned around a few months later and said, actually, Joe, I'm not the Santa Claus. I'm just operating as part of a network of Santas across the south coast of England. <laughs> I'm specifically West Sussex, which is a bit of a scale down, isn't it? In the Santa story stakes. Um, but I bring up my dad and I bring up home because when we think of Christmas, most of us can't help but think of family, of home, can we? And perhaps this is because right at the heart of the original Christmas story is a family, is a homecoming. We see this in a line from another book. It's a book called John, found in the Bible, which we'll hear read to us a little bit later. Um, but I'd love to just read a line of that to you now. And it's this. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Wow. What on earth does that mean? And how is that about Christmas? Well, sometime after accepting dad wasn't Santa anymore, I found myself uh, 18 years old at university. And I remember one night of my freshers week vividly. A bunch of us were all crammed in a college mate uh, downstairs, Ben, his bedroom. His bedroom was downstairs and we were hunched over Ben's laptop watching the grainy image of a white suited man gliding in midair down the screen. The man we were watching was Felix Baumgartner. He was an Austrian stunt artist toppling his way at the time through the highest free fall skydive ever attempted. It took him five years to prepare for this world record jump and he dropped from 127,852 feet. I remember there was a moment where the atmosphere fell into a bit of a tense lull in downstairs Ben's bedroom as we watched Felix suddenly spin more erratically and the commentator came on the stream and said oh no Felix we think has fainted. Unfortunately he managed to regain consciousness and after four minutes 19 seconds of free fall, ridiculous, he managed to land this skydive after pulling his parachute in eastern New Mexico to break the world record. He became the first person outside of a vehicle to break the sound barrier. Crazy. It was an amazing feat and amazing to watch. Now, in a bit of a similar way, Jesus came down from the dizzying heights to become like us, to be with us and to relate to us. That's what we see in this line. The Christmas story doesn't tell us that Jesus jumped out of a rocket plane to free fall to earth. That would be quite a different Christmas story. But the drop down he took was like nothing we could ever quite imagine. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. God himself, the word, took on skin and bone and blood as a human being and made his home amongst us. Forget falling from the edge of space. 
This Christmas story tells us that Jesus, God of the entire universe, including you and I and the world we inhabit, would humble himself from the heights of heaven to be born as a tiny baby. How's that for a drop? Just picture that first Christmas scene if you can. The God of the cosmos travelling in a womb from the slum town of Nazareth, born in the dark gloom of a bare straw Bethlehem stable as a refugee, the light of the whole world, so says this story about God, was laid first in a stinking animal feeding trough because there wasn't any room elsewhere. As a helpless, wriggling, gurgling, weeing baby that would need to be fed, changed and taught to talk like any other. Is that how you imagine God to be? Particularly if you're with us and this is the first time you're exploring Christianity for yourself. Have you ever stopped to wonder just how ridiculous that is? The Jewish people actually expected their coming light of the world to be a powerful, warring force of authority. It was totally against their idea of God, for God to be born as a human. But Jesus came with no fanfare. He cared so much about human beings that he chose to become one. He took a record drop to relate to us. See, every other philosophy or religion might talk about a force or energy we should tune into out there or a God out there somewhere that we can't really ever meet or know, but who might bless us enough if we spend time in its temples or follow his formulas of rituals and rules. Instead, Jesus Christ came to close that gap between him and us by stepping into the world and making his home among us. It would be a bit like if JK Rowling wrote herself into the Harry Potter stories to meet her character Harry, or something breaking into the snow globe to show life beyond the snowman's self-built horizons. In the same way, God stepped into the reality of being human, meaning we, anyone and everyone, from muddy shepherds to fancy wise men to stressed refugee parents, can have a connection, a living relationship with him. It makes God relatable. God took a record drop to relate to us. What a moment. Or is it? Is there actually anything more to be found in the Christmas story? Well, let me read out another line, um, just from a bit before the line we've just read. This is from verse 9 of John 1, and it says this, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. The true light that comes into the world at Christmas time is already the light behind everything and everyone. In fact, the Christmas story shows us divine life breaking into our world in Jesus, who reveals a God that made a wonderful world with nothing wrong. And out of deep love made you and I too, not as puppets on string, but as thinking, feeling people in his image with the freedom to enjoy it all in relationship with him. If we read on from that line in John, we get he was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognise him. He came to that which was his own. His own, that's us, you and I. Jesus came from his father to be our brother. It's no wonder then if we're a bit like him that we from time to time have these rushes of feeling for something larger than life itself. We see it in our 2020 longings for justice causes, vaccine hopes and for the world to return to normal. But maybe we see it most when we watch our faith films, read our favourite books and settle down with Sky Sports come Boxing Day. It's that weird thing where you kind of see yourself in Spider-Man or Frodo's shoes as you get so swept up in the story of a Marvel or the Lord of the Rings that you so wish it would go the way of good at all costs. The beast that turns into a charming prince by true love's kiss. The princess woken up from an enchanting spell by a saving prince. The mighty borough finally scoring a last minute playoff final goal to make it back into the Premier League. And this line from John would suggest, not just in a 2D Disney sense, that these things, these longings that sneak up on us are actually longings for our true home. Longings for good to win out, for triumph over evil, for these things to point to something more than just a fantasy. We see it even in the joyful moments in our every day too, don't we? Throwback photos on Facebook or Insta that remind us of good times. 
The best kind of I can't quite believe it anecdotes down the pub. The greatest of mates, of family holidays, hobbies and ambitions for our, our lives. We feel these things make life worth living, don't we? And it's the not so well kept secret that we're actually drawn to these things because we're related, all of us, to a God we belong to. That if you were to trace back those things that light up our lives like rays from the sun, you'd follow them back to the God of light and love and life behind everything that warms everything. Julian Barnes, the atheist journalist and writer, recently said, I don't believe in God, but I miss him. I wonder if that's you. Well, far from being just fun things or nice tales to escaping, these things, the Bible suggests, carry with them a very distant memory of a story that was once all of ours, all the time. John 1.11, found again in this text we've been reading out, suggests a little bit more of where we've gone wrong. Because the reality is we still have this quiet desperation, don't we? The world isn't how we feel and hope it should be, let alone our own lives. And John 1.11 says this, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. He was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognise him. It's as if we've forgotten our place in God's family home. Bernard Levin, the journalist, said that countries like ours are full of people who have all the material comforts they desire, or at least need, together with such non-material blessings as a happy family, and yet lead lives of quiet and at times noisy desperation, understanding nothing but the fact that there is a hole inside them and that however much food and drink they pour into it, into it however many car rides and TV and social media they stuff it with, however many well-balanced children and loyal friends they parade around the edges of it, it aches. Can I suggest to you that that aching is a Christmas story you were made to hope in but forgot. See, what this bit of the Bible in John gets at is this sense of us actively choosing to ignore the fact that God should be called family in our lives. It's not as if God's just kicked us out of our family home with him once we got a bit ratty, like a bit of a tiff with your in-laws over Christmas. It's that we've completely and utterly walked out on him being the father we were made for. And we feel the rough of that ache because in fact, Jesus himself is that chief end of all of our longings. It's as if right now we're alive and yet we're fading fast. We're a bit like the Christmas tree ripped from its roots and stuffed in the corner of a house that looks beautiful on Christmas Day. But fast forward a month and if it's real, it looks a lot less healthy. After a time of lighting up, we get to a bare tree with twigs dressed in battery dead bulb lights and tacky tinsel come January. The reality is that is us at our very core in the way that we choose to relate to God. We chose to quote what John 1.11, not to recognise him for who he is. And so all we're left with are these haunting clues of what we once were. And yet the good news is, God the Father chooses to bridge that gap by giving us his son. Not just so he can be like us, both, but so that Jesus could grow up to give himself over to the dark in us and our world and the eventual death that we were due so that instead we could be completely forgiven and in restored relationship with him forever. We get to be welcomed back receiving him into a great family home of light and love and life that way outlasts the Christmas feels with the promise that one day when King Jesus comes back against uh, again, all our great desires will be met in a completely healed and whole again world, even beyond the hopes of a vaccine. God took a record drop to relate to us and we can be related to God again. Now, if any of this has struck a chord, I'd suggest making some time to explore this. Trust me here, I didn't come from a religious home. I sort of accidentally found my life just begin to transform entirely the moment I realised my neediness for Jesus and was met with the love of a very real God. Why not read John, that ancient 
newspaper that we've been reading from tonight about Jesus's life. Or check out Alpha in the new year. I know St Barnabas are putting on a very course looking at who Jesus is. Perhaps though you sense that it's suddenly a bit more urgent for you right now as you hear this watching from your side of the screen and you feel like, you know what, I'd love to know God in the way that Joe and my mates at St Barnabas talk about. Well, John 1.12 says, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. There is an offer of family life forever there with Jesus, a child of a heavenly father. If that is you, I thought I'd offer a moment for you to just ask God to know him in that way. Um, I'm going to talk with God now. And if you'd like to, you can join in with this simple prayer that I'm about to pray from wherever you are and just make these words your own. If you'd like to say yes to this offer of uh, being God's child. OK, so I'll pray. And why not pray with me if you'd like to? Father God, thank you that Jesus left the heights of heaven to know me and save me. Forgive me for walking out on the family home. Please receive me, God, as your own again, as I choose to receive you. In your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to chat more or pray together, I'm going to be on the Zoom after and I'd love to meet you. But for now, a very Merry Christmas to you and a Happy New Year. We've really enjoyed celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ with you tonight and it's been great that you've been able to join us. We'd love you to join us immediately after this on Zoom, bring along a mince pie and there will be a Christmas quiz. There's also going to be a second Zoom meeting for you if you'd like to pray with someone following tonight's service. Uh, Joe, our speaker for this evening, and Pauline, uh, one of our prayer ministry uh, team members are going to be in a second Zoom. And so if you'd like to pray with someone about anything at all or in response to what you've heard tonight, uh, then do head on to that second Zoom. And details for both of these Zoom sessions will come up towards the end of the meeting and they'll be in the YouTube description. So that's all from us this evening. Save to wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light, he came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognise him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace, in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known.